So welcome back everybody. This is Night Flight and as you can see James Bartley is back and our topic for today will be hybridization of humanity. So uh, thank you so much for coming James and um, believe it or not when you type in um, human uh, hybridization actually there come a lot of yeah, scientific, scholarly articles, but of course, they are usually dealing with different, um, yeah, let's say subspecies, archaic human uh, subspecies, uh, subspecies, like the Denisovans that um, also made it with the Neanderthals, and uh, that this has led to variations in immunity and that you can trace it um, the, in modern living human beings, some of the genetics. So um, that probably was a natural hybridization or what would you say? Yes, if there were contemporaries, Cro-Magnon in some places lived alongside Neanderthals and one or both lived contemporaneous with Denisovans and, you know, nature takes effect and they begin to crossbreed and mate. Yes, I can see how that can happen. Uh, definitely as far as uh, the Neanderthal is concerned, but uh Yes, we're finding, from what I understand, my limited understanding of it, we're finding Denisovan DNA in, in certain human family trees. So definitely there had to be some degree of interbreeding there. Yeah, I would say uh, that as well. And um, But uh, I think, you know, um, a lot of it was that in the time that followed humans learn to adapt to new contexts you you know what i mean by that but of course we also have uh, a different hybridization uh, program and um, that is uh, something that we probably should um, focus on a little bit so um when when what can you recall what was the first time when you uh, became aware that something like that is going on well as far as the alien abduction context is concerned the first i really uh heard of it and it came to my awareness was reading uh, bud hopkins second book intruders his first book uh what was it missing time and then the second book was Intruders, and it specifically focused on a particular gal who was having a number of these ongoing, recurring alien abduction experiences. And from her perspective, from what she described in and out of hypnotic regression, she said that the aliens had taken her ovum and used it in some kind of genetic engineering sense and created a hybrid baby or babies, and during a subsequent re-abduction, she was taken by the aliens on board a ship, and they presented her with her hybrid baby. And I remember her saying in the book that uh, she thought it was beautiful. Uh, it reminded her of like an elf, like it made her think of an elf, and she came up with memory serves with a name for it. She called it Emily. Now, her case is not standard amongst many others who've had a similar experience. Many others say that, you know, that this baby was hideous. I didn't want to touch it. I didn't want to be anywhere near it, right? Oftentimes the ETs will say to the abductees, we need you to hold this baby, which seems to be a, a cross between these entities, these greys and humans. And the babies, a lot of times, as described by the eyewitnesses, they are described, these babies, as being very frail, very weak uh, in many cases, and also 
because of the lack of human contact and having been uh, born essentially on, in an alien environment, uh, they lack the emotional uh, responses that we would have and our normal human kids would have. In fact, some alien abductees are told that we need you to hold and comfort and nurture these babies during these abductions because we, we need you in some way to impart this nurturing care love onto it because it is something apparently that these aliens, particularly the greys, are incapable of doing. Somewhere along the line, they lost the ability to emote, to feel, etc. Now, there are some who would argue with that. Oh, no, the greys that I met, they're full of emotion and they're full of love, etc., etc. Well, I think it may vary with the group of the because although greys may look superficially similar, there are different factions of greys. They're not all part of one group, right? And so some people may have a different experience uh, compared to, say, the gal in the intruder's book. But getting back to your question, that's where I first became consciously aware of the whole alien hybridization agenda. And then I began working closely with Barbara Bartholik, and she gave me the inside scoop, if you will, about the human reptilian hybridization agenda. And that just took my understanding of all this to the next level, because it seems to me that people that are a lot of people that are having abductions with greys, some of their hybrid offspring are winding up more reptilian than gray looking. Right. And I think that's because some of these greys factions thereof actually work for the reptilians. They do a lot of the heavy lifting. They uh, abduct people, do the medical work, procedures, genetic hybridization, etc. But they're really doing it on behalf of the reptilians and the mantis beings. So what I've seen develop over time are, in, in general, two different types of hybrids. And there's some overlap between the two. There's the longstanding... Uh, demigod Nephilim concept of the gods interbreeding with human women and then they have offspring that are like gods, godlike, and have tremendously long lifespans compared to more normal humans. Think of Moses, think of Noah and some of these old patriarchs in the Old Testament. They were hybrids and they had quite long lifespans. And we see this also in the the Near Eastern uh, myths of uh, these kings who just li live for centuries and centuries, right? So there's that aspect where you have this hybridization between the reptilians in our example and humans, and it creates hybrids. Think of Hillary Clinton. Think of Bill Gates. Think of Anthony Fauci. They don't look like us. All they're missing is scales, okay? So they're from that particular reptilian hybridized bloodline and i'm sure over time not only upon themselves but their ancestors that greys reptilians mantis beings would occasionally abduct them and their ancestors and then do more genetic work on them essentially making them more reptilian that's why we're seeing the behaviors of these hybrid elite that we've come to know right, through our research and through the testimony of eyewitnesses who've survived being abused by them in, in these cults, what have you, that they're nothing like us. They're completely lacking in empathy. They're cruel. They're vicious. And sometimes they shapeshift, right, into reptilians or Draco beings. And on the other hand, I look at the hybridization that's probably happening more across the board. Not In the latter example, I talked about specific reptilian human hybrid bloodlines, uh, the Clintons, the Rockefellers, for example. But what Bud Hopkins, David Jacobs, and Barbara Bartholik, my mentor, talked about, and which I've also researched, you're talking across the board, all different ethnicities, people being abducted, women being implanted with fertilized ovum, sometimes they're usually their own ovum, but sometimes some other woman's ovum, implanted into their wombs, with a uh, hybridized uh, semen, if you will, uh, the, the male genetic component, some of it would be alien and some of it certainly um, 
would not be classified as human as, as we would understand it. So they imbue these characteristics in, into the genes, into the DNA, and then they implant these wombs into these women, and then these fetuses grow inside them, and eventually the aliens come by. It usually doesn't take that long, really, um, weeks or months. They'll come back, they'll extract the fetus, and then they'll bring it back to their alien environment and grow it from there, right? And that that's what's been going on across the board. And what David Jacobs and others have been talking about is this hybrid race in particular. And usually they're describing Caucasians, and they could be blonde, dark-haired, brown-haired, what have you. But there are hybrids of other races. Other races on our planet also, but in, in the case studies that Jacobs and others have done in his book, The Threat, uh, a lot of it has to do with, you know, Caucasians who have uh, been used in this alien hybridization program. And then the outcome is they see adult hybrids. They look just like humans. They're indistinguishable from humans, but they're lacking emotionally in a number of uh, key areas, right? Uh, the, like once again, the ability to emote, the ability to love, the ability to nurture, what have you. Some of them can be quite psychic. And some of the hybrids that are perfectly human looking, I feel that they have a reptilian Draco type of consciousness because it can be quite vicious, quite aggressive, quite violent, quite rapacious. They can just suddenly teleport or materialize in a woman's home and start to rape her. OK, uh, and they're quite vital, uh, you know, violent and brutal. So those are two strands of the same tree that I see. Uh, the latter example is more widespread. Uh, I, and I think certain cultures, ethnicities, certain regions of the world have been subjected to this uh, for longer, right? But I think, I think that it, it affects certain cultures and ethnicities uh, differently. Uh, I think there's a difference in degree, not in kind. It's all the same kind of genetic alien manipulation, but some ethnicities and cultures are more hard hit because they've also managed to foist these uh, dreadful religious ideologies upon them. Uh, we saw this from the so-called Christian Catholic perspective with the witch hunts, which lasted for centuries. And we're seeing this now with the whole Islamic invasion and the hardcore misogyny, hardcore hatred towards, you know, Europeans in general, but women in particular, women and children. So it's not only that they hybridize them, and also a problem with these types of uh, Islamic societies and sub-Saharan uh, societies is there's a lot of consanguinity. There's a lot of inbreeding, offspring uh, from unions between brother, sister, cousins, uncle, niece, etc., is very common in some of these countries. Pakistan is another example of that. So that's going to exacerbate and enhance that hybridization factor. And then on top of that, they overlay these, these creeds, ideolo ideologies, and religions. And then you have the you know end result of what we're seeing today. So I, I don't know if I answered your question, Judith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, from my um, talks with Gary Wayne, I remember that um, I guess there's hardly an interview that I did with him where we do not touch on the bloodlines in uh, some uh, form. And of course, um, when you boil it down, those bloodlines believe that they are descendants of the Nephilim. And um, with that, also uh, descendants of uh, fallen angels. So is that, let's say, a hybridization story from a different perspective? I think it's the same, essentially, because mm -hmm. it's this concept of rule by divine right. Uh, yeah. Think of Emperor Hirohito. His lineage claims descent from, you know, this... Japanese god or goddess, right? And we see similarities in other cultures, in European cultures, where they believe, uh, the Romans, the Greeks were uh, steeped in this ideology that they, uh, their leaders, their emperors, their uh, dictators, their Caesars, 
were descended from the gods. And, and they will claim lineage from this, that, or the other uh, Roman or Greek god because they understood the concept of hybridization. And, and we see these stories in folklore and myth. Uh, Heracles, Hercules is a classic example, right? Where uh, a woman is impregnated by Zeus, the god, and then the child that comes out of that is a super being Hercules. And then we have the story of Alexander the great who, whose mother apparently was a high priestess of the Dionysian cult who claimed, in fact, told Alexander that uh, Philip the second is not your real father. Your real father is Zeus. He came to be one night in the guise of a serpent. Okay. So, and also if you look at the, uh, uh, the book written about, the Caesars, uh, I think it was called the Ten Caesars, but it was written by a, an ancient Roman historian. He would have been like a David Icke of his day, put it that way. And he says that Julius Caesar, his mother, Julia, was impregnated by a uh, incubi, an incubi that looked like a reptile or a lizard. So we see all these strands and the, these similarities. And what did Alexander do? He went out to con conquer everything he could conquer. Didn't want to stop until he was forced to. But Julius Caesar, similar, it's just conquest, conquest, conquest. So these are two examples, historical figures who, you know, some sources at the time, including Alexander's own mother, said that your birth is not normal. Your birth is a result of my union with a god, okay? So that concept is embedded in all these earthly uh, cultures and, and folklore throughout the world of the gods, if you will, ETs in our example, interbreeding with humans uh, willingly or otherwise, and then the offspring, they're like the, these Nephilim uh, demigod types. They have more abilities. They have uh, a longer lifespan. They're born to rule, essentially. And, and the people, the followers, the commoners are in, in, inculcated with that belief that uh, these people, the, the Windsors, the royal families of Europe, whatever, they're different from you. They're blue bloods. They're, they're, they're descended from the gods. Well, you people are mere commoners, right? And now what's interesting is in some of the Near Eastern traditions and Mediterranean cultures, especially, uh, there was an understanding that there were a multitude of gods, a pantheon of gods. So even though someone like Julius Caesar could claim descendancy from the gods, the commoners who he ruled over, well, they had their own, you know, bunch of gods too. So there was an understanding in the old days that these super beings, if you will, had the ability to mic essentially micromanage every aspect of, of human life to the point where because of the malign influence of all these hybridized uh, priesthoods, right? What have you, uh, in order to propitiate the gods, appease the gods, they would offer up sacrifices. You know, could be a votive offering, could be food, could be liquor, could be a calf, could be a cow, could be a baby, depending on the culture, right? I mean, the, uh, the Phoenicians were a horrific example of this, of the thousands of children they sacrificed to, the Moloch, and then you look at the Aztecs and what they did, and the Mayans. So this, this is where the rubber meets the road, that there's an understanding amongst those people in those days that our rulers are connected, they're descended from the gods, and this is what they expect of us, like toil, suffering, slavery, and, and, and sacrifice, if that's what's required. And they will go to war on behalf of these gods. If the augurs and if the soothsayers and the oracles say, well, the gods say it's time to go to war because these rulers, these dictators, they consult with people like this, right? You know, they examine the entrails of a just recently sacrificed bull or something like Alexander did. And that's a good reason to go to war. Oh, look, the signs are favorable. The, the gods say, go ahead, right? So people have to understand in those days, there was a general understanding that our lives were under the control and guidance uh, of non-human super beings. And, and here we are today. And I, I've seen the same thing, essentially. Mm. Yeah. And uh, when you mentioned uh, the UK, they even have it in their 
parliamentary system, the House of Commons. Yes, you're right. <laughs> and then you have the House of Lords. And if you've had uh, Pierre Sabach on the show, he talks about the term Lord. If mm. you broke it down to its etymological roots, its linguistic roots, it means he who is from or he is born, he who is born of a vessel, a ship, yeah. but in the context of a celestial vessel, a celestial ship. So, so a lord refers to a being, a super being that comes from a celestial ship, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There is also um, the question, how can I put this? Um, you, you know, when you mix DNA, genes, and what have you, um, to a certain de uh, extent, you are diluting the original DNA genes. So is that even preferable? Usually when you start diluting something, it is not getting better. Sometimes, yes, in rare instances, but in general, I would say it's better not to tamper with it. You know what I mean? I, I would agree because it goes back to what Bob Lazar said and also uh, Leah Haley and other alien abductees, contactees have said that the ETs have told them that, that human beings are containers and one can only infer containers of what? Well, I'm thinking maybe containers of souls, right? And so every time that we have another generation of uh, people that whose family tree has been interfered in this fashion, where there's uh, alien abductions, genetic hybrid, uh, genetic engineering going on, uh, occasional, sometimes frequent incubi, succubi, reptilian sexual attacks, sexual unions, rapes of the women in a certain bloodline, because you will see that when one really studies this, that it's, it definitely is uh, multi-generational. Not only are people having abductions multi-generationally, but the women in some of these family trees, bloodlines are, 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 are getting raped by reptilians, like one generation after the other. It may skip a generation or two, but eventually they'll come back, right? So it's very much how they mold and create, and uh, it's a form of terraforming, right, uh, people. And so, yes, I, I see it very much as diluting because every time these hybridizations and another generation is created in this fashion, I think that much more of the human soul consciousness connection to the divine has been kind of like reduced, lack of a better term. So mm -hmm. if you look at today, you have these extreme examples, which are actually quite common. If you look at these foaming at the mouth liberals that just come out of college or, or in college, and then they see them throughout all these NGOs and, and all these institutes, right? all these policy making institutes and they're just forming at the mouth left hard idiots really, but they're hybridized. They're, they're supposed to be like that. Right. Uh, in, in their head, because they, they're really in their head space. They're out of their heart center. They're into their head space. So they don't have an intuitive connection to the divine anymore. Uh, they were born that way. And then it was exacerbated by the cultural Marxist indoctrination in the schools. So now Everything has an emotive uh, value to it, uh, reason, logic, rationality, all that stuff is, goes out the window. Everything is reduced to feelings. How do you feel about this subject? How do you feel about that? Uh, orange man, bad, right? That's all it is nowadays. But see, that's a form of hybridization, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's across the board, all these ethnicities. So you will see Asians like this. You will see blacks like this. You will see whites like this. But they're the end result of a multitude by this point of successive generations that have been hybridized. And then you add that overlay of the cultural Marxism, which is just a, an alien programming. And whatever vestige of humanity that college or recently graduated college kid in our example started out with, right? For the most part, it's gone by this point. 
It, if you if you look at the lack of empathy, the spitefulness, and the the hate that spews out of these people, there's at least at a conscious level, there's not much humanity left. And I think that's the end. That's the goal of of a lot of this hybridization is to recreate this Sodom and Gomorrah, Babylon type society, where everyone's backstabbing each other, everyone's a threat to one another, everyone is just living this like perverse. Uh, hybridized lifestyle. And I think that they've made serious inroads in that direction. They're starting in the schools now with children, grooming them and it, indoctrinating them. It's, it's truly frightening what's happening. Mm. I also thought that, you know, there are groups um, on the internet that say, yeah, okay, uh, we are here. Of course, we are the good ones. And uh, we also have our hybrids uh, here. And, um, you know, then the you have this leader and then a group assembles around him. And then you can see how people, um, you know, all of a sudden, yeah, I w would like to become a hybrid as well. And um, <clears throat> they think, that this is a kind of upgrade for them, yeah, because then I am at least a little bit part of that group that is fighting for humanity. And of course, all the other hybrids from that group, from that group, they are all shitty, <laughs> yeah, they never go there. And boom, you have another divide and conquer. Yes. Absolutely. And then you could you could splice that out even further, right? You know, divide it even more. And, and in general, you have the good ETs, the bad ETs, and some people think there's only good ETs, and some people think there's only bad ETs, when actually the truth is somewhere in the middle. But within the good ET concept, they can endlessly divide that. Oh, you know, I'm I'm from this con star constellation. I'm from that star constellation. I'm part of this alien federation or that alien you know, galactic council, whatever the case may be. Well, maybe, maybe not. There's no way that I can confirm or you know make that determination. That's something they've got to figure out, right? But nevertheless, they have this belief system that's grown out of it. And to, to some degree, it's in, I don't know if it's conscious or subconscious that they're doing this, but it's almost a form of branding themselves, kind of like marketing, you know, it's like, uh, well, I, I represent this type of alien race from this star system and and we're good. And, and you know, uh, you, you see this with channelers, people like Bashar and people like that. Right. Just, mm. I mean, don't get me started in that direction, but there are extreme examples of that, of that cult mentality. And, and there's no doubt in my mind that uh, people who, you know, have taken the time to study Bashar and others like him, that there's something much deeper going on there. It's not just all the feel-good pablum that they're spewing out. There's something deeper going on. Yeah. And, but I found it, you know, I, I have observed it. Um, I, I wouldn't say I was really part of that group, but I was a little bit inside and more from a, a observer's perspective. And honestly, it gave me the heebie-jeebies to see how willing people are to subjugate themselves. Yeah, and all of them would have told you that they are very awake, that they totally know what's going on and uh, that they are on the right side, you know? Well, if you look at what some of the people have been saying, I attended a conference uh, years ago with Barbara Bartholik, and there was a woman there. Uh, she was part of the panel that was on. Uh, there was like a speaker's panel. And this woman kept referring to herself as a John Hopkins girl. Oh, I'm so special from a medical, psychological standpoint that Johns Hopkins did a study on me. So I'm a Johns Hopkins girl, right? Mm -hmm. And she was talking about how during one particular alien abduction experience, when the aliens came into the house, when her and her daughter were still awake, her young daughter, 
she was abducted, this Johns Hopkins girl woman, and her daughter was also abducted. And then later when she was returned, she found her daughter and her daughter was unable to move. Her legs were like rubber, like jelly, and she couldn't stand. She couldn't even crawl. Right. In her own words, John Hopkins girl said uh, her legs were like rubber. Now, someone in the audience asked, okay, well, was it the same group of aliens that abducted you that night? Because she's always implying that her aliens are good, right? Mm -hmm. someone, so someone asked her, is that the same group of aliens that took your daughter and left her in that state that she's in with rubbery legs? She goes, oh, no, it was a different ET group that abducted my daughter. So when you have that level of mind control and brainwashing, where they justify themselves, oh, well, you know, I had a good, you know, spiritual experience with the ETs, but I come back and I find my daughter and she's crawling around and trying to, you know, with rubbery legs, but that's a different ET group. So there's empathy missing there. There's uh, understanding and awareness missing there because the ego has been activated. She's a Johns Hopkins girl. So if Johns Hopkins University is interested in her, why wouldn't the aliens be interested in her if she's that special, you see? And, and I've seen variations of that. I've been at conferences when women, blonde-haired women, will walk up to me and just introduce themselves by saying, hello, I'm a Pleiadian hybrid walk-in, right? <laughs> how, do I answer, how do I answer that, right? <laughs> well, that's cool, right? Yeah. But the, the mentality of being special, of being elite, mm -hmm. of being connected to a apparently, supposedly spiritual race of ETs, higher dimensional ETs. And that it, it's similar to the mentality in the old days of the demigods. Oh, so-and-so is a demigod because his father was a god and his mother was human. So here we have, and now he's a king. Well, a lot of these people that call themselves hybrids and what have you, you just see them at UFO conferences, but they're not kings and queens. Now there are real hybrids that are kings and queens though. But that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a different end of the spectrum, if you ask me. Yeah. Would you say that uh, those hybrids are considered from, you know, the ruling class hybrids, even a lesser hybrid? I would think so. I, I would think that they regard humanity at large, even extremely hybridized aspects of humanity, to be beneath them. They're, they're the top And we see this with certain cultures in the world, certain uh, ideologies of, of a supremacist notion, like this, that, or the other race is superior to all the rest for some highfalutin godly reason, right? And uh, we see this across the board. A number of different cultures feel this way. So when you talk about the so-called elite elite that presume to run this planet, they definitely think of us as just like, oh, let them eat insects, let them eat cake, right? Or... <laughs> cakes filled with insects. Uh, I mean, that's how they feel about us. And they're not above wanting to depopulate us or make us sick with their medical treatments and everything else because they don't see us the same. Uh, they literally see themselves as gods and their ability to control the perceptions of society at large, right? It is in modern times, it's not, it's without parallel. Their ability To, to still to this day to make people believe whatever they want them to believe. It's, uh, it's amazing how that process is played out, but it's also indicative of how the people who fall for this, the people who believe whatever they're told, how much of their own human essence they've given away in the process, how much of their own humanity and greater awareness and consciousness they've relinquished by going along with this, you know, just every time they give in, every time they go along with something, That's more of themselves they're giving away, which they may never get back, may never get back. Mm. Yeah. Um, I have read somewhere that when you crossbreed, that the first offspring looks pretty alien. And I am not quite sure, are these offsprings infertile 
th that's a very good point because according to some of the alien abductees, they've been told by the aliens that's abducting them and doing these genetic uh, engineering uh, things to them that that particular alien race has reached the end of their biological evolutionary tether. They mm -hmm. cannot evolve anymore. And if you look at them, some of them are, are sexually amorphous. They, they are at least outwardly visibly are lacking in any kind of genitalia, which would tell you if they're a male or a female. Now, some people will say, well, the energy I was getting from this particular being was male or female. I can understand that. But, um, well, hold on a second. Let me just, can I just pause this real quick? I'm sorry. Oh. So, so, so we, what, what, oh, please. Yeah, we, we were talking about um, uh, if they are infertile. Yes. And it, it seems that some of these alien races have lost the ability to reproduce because they don't yeah. seem to have you know, the genitalia required for such a thing. So they've resorted to the time-tested uh, process of genetic engineering. So sometimes they will have human females carry the uh, developing fetuses in their wombs for a little while, and then they'll take them out. Sometimes they'll have some kind of like device, some kind of uh, like growing device, for lack of a better term. We've seen drawings that came out of uh, Dulce in New Mexico that shows all these little baby aliens being grown out of some kind of bubble sack kind of thing. And then we have a testimony, people like Ted Rice, who talk about how what they've observed in some of these experiences. And there, there has to be a connection here, I, I would think, where they're observing what seems to them to be like a cow's womb, a cow's udder complex system. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they're using it to give birth to these alien babies or hybrid babies. So if the, uh, the aliens themselves are unable to reproduce, they're going to do the next best thing. They're either going to use a technical uh, means or a, a human host woman or some kind of uh, cow kind of um, like a gestation growing process. And there's probably others that I'm not aware of, right? So as far as the babies, like like a mule, for example, is what is this, a product of, of a horse and a donkey? He created a mule, but the mule can't breed. The mule can't have successive mule generations. They can only come about through a union of, of a donkey and a horse. Well, there may be something to that with some of these alien races, at least, because many, many people have said that these babies look really sickly. They look really frail. They're holding these babies. They look like they're dying. Some of them look like they're already dead, right? So, and some people, uh, I remember Daryl Sims was telling me years ago, he thought that there must be a high mortality rate with some of these alien babies and some of these alien hybrids because they look so frail. They look so malnourished, right? Uh, you know, how many of them actually survive to become adults, right? Um, yeah, I I put that in there because in uh, what I started to say, so the first generation looks pretty alien. Then in the second generation, they look a little bit more human. And then starting with the third or fourth generation, um, they can live among humans without yes. anybody noticing. But that would mean those offsprings have to be fertile. If that yes. is true. Have you ever found anything in those research papers that have been given to you that um, with certain species that, yeah, after a couple of, uh, you know, the third or the uh, fourth offspring then was, uh, let's say, released into the wild. Yes, in the society. Uh, I, I've i talked about this before. I may have mentioned it on a new show, but um, one of the gals that I was in contact with was one of the women who worked with David Jacobs, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, she told me that she was tasked by the aliens to try to train 
these human looking aliens to fit into society. Now rewind a little bit. The, the late father of my friend, Helga Moro, her father was Dr. Frederick Augustus Kepars. He was one of these uh, European scientists who came to America uh, in the 1930s, late 1930s, and wound up becoming part of the aerospace industry. And he told Helga when Helga was in her teens that everything in history is a lie. He was all emotionally distraught. And it, it, the story that came out of him was that he had to teach these human looking aliens how to blend in to society. Okay. Now he regarded them as aliens. They just aliens that look very human. Now what my friend who worked with David Jacobs told me was, well, these weren't aliens so much. These were hybrids that she was uh, supposed to train. And they have actually set up domiciles for them where they live in these communal settings and homes, apartments, what have you, uh, two or more. And her job was to go in and teach them how to arrange their furniture. And like, for example, she said that uh, she opened the refrigerator in the home of these hybrids and there's, they're different ages, like uh, presumably what appears to be like a husband, wife and children. Right. But they're all hybrids. And she'd open up the refrigerator and there would be all these pots and pans in there. She'd go, no, 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 that's not how you do it. You got to put these in the cupboards, right? Mm. And then she'd have to take them to the stores, purchase items with money, and show them how to get the change back, Kleingeld, right? Get the mm. change back and how to, how to count out the money, right? So she had to show them all these basic things. Now, getting back to your question, after a certain number of generations, they begin to look more and more human and can fit into society. I would say that was, that's the case. Yes. They mm -hmm. may not be able to get it the first time around, but after successive attempts, successive generations, I mean, if the Anunnaki Chronicles, Sumerian Chronicles, anything to go by, what those um, cuneiform tablets reveal is that the Anunnaki spent hundreds of thousands of years trying to perfect this hybrid race to do their slave work for them. So it took them a long time, right? It may have taken, you know, other races less time or, or longer. It just varies from civilization to civilization and what they're trying to get out of the hybridization program, right? The mm -hmm. Anunnaki apparently only wanted slaves because they didn't want to do all the work, right? So, yeah. And then, uh, you know, and then you look at society now and they're imbuing all these characteristics of, you know, violence and, and rapaciousness and what have you and being unreasonable. They're imbuing that into all these hybrids nowadays. Mm. We also have um, people out there that are saying uh, when it comes to transhumanism that there is an underlying um, yeah, motivation to eradicate humanity. Would you agree with that? Well, that was uh, David Jacobs' thesis and others, that mm -hmm. these hybrids would eventually be used to supplant the human race and would be the workforce, essentially, for the aliens themselves. And the consciousness of these hybrids, these hybrid humans, uh, they wouldn't have the full spectrum of emotions that we have, you know, from, you know, ecstasy on one extreme to like mouth foaming rage to the other and all points in between. Uh, they would be pretty, there's a term that they use, a flatness of effect, right? Where they don't exhibit much emotions. As a matter of fact, Barbara Bartholik uh, worked with, in fact, she was taught, trained by a world-class hypnotherapist. If memory serves, the guy worked with the Navy or something um, or, or, or some branch of the service. But he was a very, very skilled hypnotic regressionist. And Barbara learned from him. And on his own, what he used to do was not regressions or past life regressions. What he would do with his subjects, with their permission, of course, he would future progress them. He would hypnotize them and make them uh, tell him what it's like uh, from a future incarnation perspective, right? 
And he said time and again, what came back from all these different people he did this to was, well, in the future, the earth's going to be pretty polluted. There's going to be a big dome. Uh, people will be living under, under dome cities. Uh, there's not going to be many people left. Uh, most of the people will be hybrids of one kind or another uh, between aliens and humans. Uh, there'll be no more emotions. So there'll be no more laughter. That's going to be all gone. That stuck out in my mind, my memory, when, when Barbie told me that. You know, she was told there won't even be any laughter in the future. The people will be just smart enough to work the computers and work the machines, and that's it. And, and you may be right. They may be infertile. They may not be able to reproduce. They may only be able to repopulate them through this genetic engineering means we, we've been talking about or, or, or you know pondering mm -hmm. about, right? And now some of the hybrids are certainly rapacious. Uh, they've manifested this uh, tendency to, to want to rape human women, right? So at least the, the sexual act part, however violent it may be, uh, is there. They're capable of that. But whether or not they're able to reproduce, that, that's another story. We don't know. I mean, we don't know how viable, if they even have sperm, if it's viable, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But we do know that some of these hybrids can rape that much. We do know. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, some, some people say, yeah, transhumanism is a wonderful thing. It will free humanity from uh, a lot of illness and disease. Uh, oh. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'm not so sure. In the but, last couple of few years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but on the other hand, um, what do we really know? What is being implanted into us? And is there a possibility that this machinery imprisons the human consciousness so that, you know, after a while... I mean, don't get me wrong. If somebody who is paralyzed can walk again, more power to you. I'm all for it. But my experience <laughs> tells me there is something else going on. Yeah. And how do we know that in the long run, we will not be just cocks? In a, to to serve a system like like a little ant, you know, and uh, the ability to think in out of the box and not only into uh, a prepackaged pathway is completely gone. I yes. mean, that possibility is there. Well, we're already seeing massive inroads in that direction. Well, we, if we just look at all these thoughtless, foaming at the mouth liberals who don't have an original idea in their head, yet they're so emotional about everything. That's an example of that, right? They have no self-awareness. And if they have no self-awareness, how could they possibly comprehend what's going on around them? How could they possibly discern like things that are very nuanced, right? They're not black and white, not absolutist, this or that. I mean, there's shades of gray. There's nuance in the middle. They're, they're incapable of seeing that, right? So I, I think that's well, we're seeing that play out every day now. It's actually um, it's actually pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. So uh, James, our first hour is gone, and uh, yeah, we will see the patrons on the other side. <laughs>